guys, in this video, we will be talking about the disorder called as cardiomyopathies. Cardiomyopathies basically it's a clinical disorder and which has a very important pathological basis. So what I'll do in this video is I'll be discussing about the pathological pathogenesis as well as the pathological morphology of the heart whereas Dr. Thameen will be talking about the clinical features and the treatment options available for the disease. Starting with this term called as cardiomyopathy. The classical meaning of the word cardio, heart, myo, muscle and pathy means disease. So actually it refers to heart muscle disease. Heart muscle disease. But by definition, the word cardiomyopathies it refers to a heterogeneous group of diseases of myocardium obviously of myocardium associated with associated with mechanical or electrical dysfunction okay it can be either a mechanical or electrical dysfunction electrical dysfunction now what happens because of this two finding is either mechanical or electrical is there is ventricular hypertrophy or ventricular dilatation okay so this will cause causing ventricular hypertrophy or dilatation ventricular hypertrophy or it can be ventricular dilatation now in the same definition we can also add what is the basic reason of this the basic reason are usually genetic but can also be acquired causes okay so due to a variety of causes due to a variety of causes usually genetic usually genetic now i understand it's a very long definition but it has a lot of meaning to tell us if you understand see the basic thing you should remember in the definition is the cardiomyopathy basically is a disease of mechanical or electrical dysfunction first thing first it may cause hypertrophy may cause dilation usually the causes are genetical so i think these three things must be there in the definition without which you will not be able to understand what is cardiomyopathies now etiological wise or classification wise it can either be classification it can either be primary or can be secondary obviously primary means the problem is in the heart itself secondary means it is acquired due to any other systemic causes so primary it may be it actually refers to genetical or acquired disease of myocardium of heart but secondary but secondary it's a component of systemic disorder it is due to systemic dis order is due to systemic disorder so it may be primary it may be secondary most of the causes are primary but if you go to the restrictive type of cardiomyopathies they usually are secondary in reasons secondary in causes now to understand this basic thing let's see a image see this is how the three types of cardiomyopathies are in these three types if you look at the types here So this is the normal heart this is the normal heart and as you look here what has happened is the heart has basically dilated look at a hugely dilated heart so when the heart is dilating it may accommodate more blood but i'll tell you later on that the basic problem in here is actually it is not able to contract properly so the heart is dilating here but the problem is this heart will not be able to contract properly and that is the reason it causes a type of systolic dysfunction systolic dysfunction in hypertrophic heart look at this heart 
the heart muscle is overall globally the overall global image of the heart is showing you dilatation so not dilatation it is hypertrophy so because of the huge amount of hypertrophy the heart will not fill properly because heart cannot expand because the heart cannot expand i will tell you this will basically be a diastolic dysfunction diastolic dysfunction and this one is restrictive again the problem occurs in diastolic dysfunction because is restriction so the heart cannot be expanding properly the restriction i'll tell you it may occur because of tumor it may be because of amyloid and various other options right so based on this let's start with the types of cardiomyopathies okay the types of cardiomyopathies there are actually three types the first one is dilated dilated the basic problem here is systolic dysfunction it causes systolic systolic dysfunction it causes systolic dysfunction okay the basic problem is it causes systolic dysfunction okay now the reason of causing a systolic dysfunction i'll tell you later on is basically the contraction power is not transmitted enough to the sarcomeres okay and hence it is causing systolic dysfunction you can write in bracket it is due to impairment of contractility impairment of contractility the second one is hypertrophic hypertrophic the main problem here is diastolic dysfunction diastolic dysfunction diastolic dysfunction because the main problem is impairment of compliance okay there is impairment of filling or compliance filling of blood obviously filling of blood it is also called as impairment of compliance and the third one is also the same it is restrictive restrictive cardiomyopathies in restrictive cardiomyopathy again there is a diastolic dysfunction the same exactly diastolic dysfunction and that means there is impairment of filling there is impairment of filling so the three main the three main types of cardiomyopathies one of them will be basically a problem in contraction one of them is a basically problem of compliance the third one is also a problem of compliance but these two have a different causes they have different causes what can lead to the problem in the cardiomyopathies okay now having understood this today we will be basically discussing about the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies to understand this let's have a view on this image this is an image from robins so there is a there is a cell membrane there is a cell membrane as you see here and here is where the contraction occurs okay so contraction ke liye it requires atp as you all know this is a this is a mitochondria so mitochondria is the area where you can expect a production of atp by electron transport chain so the atp energy from the mitochondria is basically transferred to the sarcomeres and this sarcomere because of contraction it causes the normal contractility of the heart there are two theories proposed one theory proposes defective force transmission from the mitochondria to the sarcomeres from here to here this is basically seen in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies a second reason is a defective force transmission from the sarcomeres to the actual myocyte fibers that is seen in dilated cardiomyopathies and what are the reasons usually the reasons are genetical if you remember the usually the reasons are genetical now let's assume what is happening here dekho if you look carefully so you all know see this is the myosin heavy chain this red fiber is the myosin uh, heavy chain and these are the actin this green one are the actin filaments now if you look at the center point of this from here to this area okay to this area this this is a z line you remember this is a z line this is a z line and this is also a z line now what happens the two z lines are interconnected suppose this is a pen so the two z lines are interconnected by a fiber called as titan 
So if the titan is absent, if there is no titan, these sarcomere fibers of Z line will be distally, they will be very far away. That means the passive range of movement of the heart will be more. That is the reason it dilates. So the main gene responsible for the hyper, sorry, the dilated cardiomyopathy is titan gene. What is titan gene? Remember my pen and this pen is basically attaching the two Z lines together. Now, other gene as you see here on this myosin, look here, this myosin, these are the chains here. This is called as beta myosin heavy chain. The beta myosin heavy chain, if absent, it will not be able to transfer the force and that is seen mostly in the hypertrophic causes of cardiomyopathy. As I told you, told you, today our main topic of discussion is the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. So among all of them, let us discuss about the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy called as HOCM. HOCM that is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Causes or etiologies are almost 100% genetical, almost 100% genetical cause and the reason of this is sarcomere proteins, genetical mutations in sarcomere proteins. So the basic problem because of the mutation in sarcomere protein is the defective force transmission, okay. Now, what are the proteins I just write it? First write, because of this issue, what happens is there is a defect in energy transfer, energy transfer from mitochondria to sarcomere. Okay, the basic problem is energy transfer from the mitochondria to the sarcomere. Few reasons that are proposed because of this, the few reasons that is proposed because of this are some mutations. I will write the mutations here. The mutation mainly for this is beta myosin heavy chain, myosin heavy chain. So, write it beta MHC, okay. Beta myosin heavy chain is a, one of the most common mutation that is seen in this condition, beta myosin heavy chain. It can other also be troponin T, troponin T, it can be alpha tropomyosin and can be myosin binding protein C, myosin binding protein C, it can be myosin binding protein C. But having said this, the most common is beta myosin heavy chain, beta myosin heavy chain. So because of which the energy is not transferred properly from the mitochondria to sarcomere, so sarcomere cannot contract. Ultimately because of application of more and more pressure, it causes global hypertrophy in the myocardium. So now we will see what are the morphological changes in the heart, okay. Let us now discuss about the morphological changes in the heart muscle. Morphology. Well, what do you expect is the heart muscle should show you an overall massive enlargement of the ventricles. But here comes a point. See, suppose this is a ventricle and in between the ventricle wall, this is a septum. So basically the septum increases more in size than the ventricular wall. If septum also increases, what I am trying to say is, suppose, look, this is a ventricle wall, this is a septum. Okay, this is a left ventricle, it's a right ventricle. Now, if there occurs an overall hypertrophy of the entire ventricle like this. So, if the entire ventricle increases, it is called a symmetric enlargement, symmetric. But in hypertrophic, it doesn't happen like this. In hypertrophic, what happens? The septum enlarges to enormous degree. The septum, it enlarges to this enormous degree like this. Whereas the left ventricle enlarges little bit. Left ventricle wall, it does not enlarge to that much amount. That means the wall, if you see, this part I am now shading, this is the 
septum. This area is a septum area. Okay. So now what will happen? Because the septum is increasing more than the myocardium, the septum is increasing more than the myocardium. I will call this asymmetric enlargement of the heart. It is not symmetric and hence it is called as asymmetric. Asymmetric septal hypertrophy. Asymmetric septal hypertrophy. This is the main main change you must remember that is occurring in a HOCM. So the problem are enormous. This will be taught also by Dr. Thamim here that basically the problem here is enormous because this will cause a filling defect. How can the heart fill? There is no space to fill. This is the area where the heart could have filled. So the blood amount that is being collected here is very less. This is the amount of blood here. And this blood is very less compared to the normal blood. Look at the normal amount of blood. The blood amount is very less here. Because the blood amount is less here, it is actually a diastolic dysfunction. And ultimately, because of the huge amount of septal enlargement, it also causes the obstruction in the left ventricular outflow. Because of which various problems starts coming up. Okay. So let's now write what are the morphological findings to be understood. First of all, there is a there is a thickening of the ventricular septum, ventricular septum thickening, ventricular septum. is to left ventricular thickening, the ratio is around 3 is to 1. So what is enlarging more? Septum and that is the reason I am calling this asymmetric septal hypertrophy. I am calling this asymmetric septal hypertrophy. Well, 10 percent cases can be symmetric. Okay. 10% cases can be symmetric, but majority of the cases, that is 90% cases, they show asymmetrical hypertrophy, asymmetrical hypertrophy. And if you see this configuration, see here, this typical, this typical area is looking like a banana. Isn't it looking like a banana? This whole area, look at this area, this whole area here, this whole area here, it looks like a banana being placed here. This is called as banana-like configuration, this ventricle wall. And what I say is, can't you put a simple banana here? Deekho? So beautiful banana putting here. This typical configuration is called as banana like configuration. Let's write this. This typical configuration. So left ventricular cavity, left ventricular cavity shows banana like configuration. Okay, banana like configuration. It causes basically, and this most prominent, this whole septal enlargement is most prominent in the sub aortic region. This whole enlargement you see here, this whole enlargement is mostly in the sub aortic region, and that is the reason it causes basically obstruction in the blood flow. Okay, so basically, the asymmetric atrophy, the main site, the main site of this is sub aortic, and that is the reason it causes mainly obstruction in the blood flow from the left ventricle, left ventricle. Now, what are the main histopathological findings, okay, histopath findings, microscopy. The basic is number one, massive myocyte hypertrophy, massive myocyte hypertrophy. The size of this muscle fiber is more than 40 micrometer. Whereas the normal is say only 15, normal is around 15 micrometer, this shows a huge enlargement in the myocyte fiber. It is massive myocyte hypertrophy. Second, haphazardly arranged, haphazard, haphazardly arranged myocyte fiber, myocyte fiber, haphazardly arranged myocyte fibers. It is called as, right in red color, it is called as myofiber disarray. Myofiber disarray is the name used. Myofiber disarray. And you may find some amount of interstitial fibrosis. There can be interstitial fibrosis. There can be interstitial fibrosis. 
So, if you put this information in a diagram, how will it look like? See, suppose I draw a normal myocardium muscle, this should look like this branch fibers and normal myocardial fibers, like this. Okay, they are regularly and horizontally arranged. But what will you see here is there is massive enlargement in the muscle fibers, like this. And if you look at the arrangement, they are all are haphazard, they are not in a Transfer, not in transverse fashion, they all are haphazardly arranged. These all are large muscle fibers. Let me color this, it will become more and more clear. This is a normal muscle fiber. And look at the hugely enlarged muscle fiber. The size has almost become around 40 micrometer, that is almost three times the size of the normal myocardium. The size of the nucleus is also increasing. So, normally, the nuclear size may be around one third the, of the size of the muscle fiber. Now, the nuclear size is enormously increased like this. Hugely enlarged muscle fiber. Hugely enlarged muscle fiber. And there may be a small amount of fibrosis being seen here. So, there may be a small amount of fibrosis here. There may be collagen fibers in this area. So, what you are seeing is, what you are seeing is hugely enlarged muscle fiber, what you are seeing is nucleus is enlarged, look at the fibrosis in this area and the abnormal arrangement, they are not horizontal arranged, they all are abnormally arranged like this. It is the basic feature of the hypertrophic, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, the main problem is gastrointestinal function because of which the stroke volume will definitely decrease. And the stroke volume decreases, it may lead to various symptoms which may also lead to a severe ischemia in the part of the heart which will be may cause a sudden cardiac death. In fact, the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in a young adult, athletic adult is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Morphologically, the image will show you a feature like this. Look at this brown like configuration, you have an enlarged, hugely enlarged septum, look at the septum, hugely enlarged septum. In contrast to this is the left ventricle wall and this is a banana. Here is where you can place the banana here. This is a banana like configuration. It is the basic finding that you see in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, HOCM. Well, this is the myocyte disarray. None of the myocytes are actually arranged horizontally. They all are haphazard. And this haphazard arrangement is called as myocyte disarray. Look at the enlarged nucleus. You see this en nucleus, this one? This is the nucleus here. Look at the enlarged nucleus you see here or this area, this is the myocyte disarray along with the hypertrophic muscle. This area at the center, this may be the basic fibrosis that you can expect in the condition called as hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. After this, Dr. Him will be talking about the clinical features and about the complication and the treatment that is possible for the condition HOCM, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Thanks a lot. So, after the discussion of pathophysio by Dr. Praveen, I will be covering the clinical features, the treatment aspect and the management. So, if you look at the clinical features, mainly I want to focus on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy today. And if you look at the clinical features of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the manifestations are mainly driven by three main components of the patho and that is the cardiac dysfunction that is left ventricle undergoing hypertrophy which is mainly asymmetric in nature and this LV dysfunction that develops because of this can be either a systolic problem or a diastolic problem. The reason for the diastolic problem and this is what we refer to as progressing towards heart failure with preserved ejection fraction which is also referred to as a diastolic dysfunction. And the other component is the left ventricle asymmetric septum coming in the way and creating obstruction. This obstructing septum of the LV blood throwing being thrown out at the iota is going to result in a obstructive pathology. So one is a di diastolic problem, one is a filling problem, the other is an obstructive problem. And this ob obstructive problem ideally you would expect that it should come with progressing towards heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So, you see a combination of both the problems here, you will see patients having both a systolic dysfunction 
and the patient is going to have both a uh, diastolic dysfunction so let's discuss about how the diastolic dysfunction is occurring i'm sure dr pravin would have covered in the pathology about the various aspects of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and if you look at the concept here if the left ventricle is becoming hypertrophied the more hypertrophied the left ventricle is this left atrium this left ventricle the more thicker the left ventricle is then obviously the inner diameter will keep decreasing the amount of space available to fill is decreasing and the various changes that are occurring in the muscle the fibrosis the muscle disarray and all that together the lv does not dilate properly does not stretch and receive the blood if it cannot stretch and receive the blood obviously that results in a diastolic problem so lv doesn't fill properly a consequence of this filling problem will result in pulmonary hypertension and left atrial dilatation so this is basically going to put the load if the lv doesn't fill it will put the load on the on the left atrium on the pulmonary circuit and the patient will have features of pulmonary edema so most of the clinical features you will see are basically based on this pulmonary edema that is slowly building up in this patients you will also see the systolic dysfunction this is because the septum is coming in the way and not allowing the lv to pump the blood out and this blockage that the septum is creating is going to result in systolic dysfunction so these patients will have syncopal attack the left syncope they are going to come with ischemic problems this is because the blood that is there in the aorta and the pressures in the aorta dictate the coronary blood flow so the reason why you find ischemic heart disease as one of the problems in this disease is partly because the aorta is not receiving good amount of blood partly because the lv is thickened so much and the uh, proportionately coronary blood flow is less the lv mass is more and this creates a difference difference uh, you know a uh, dissociation between the lv mass and the coronary blood flow and because of this these patients are prone for developing micro infarcts and ischemic heart disease features can occur so this is a array of features that occur so that means in a patient with hocm hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy you will see patients having both a problem in filling as a problem in pumping out because of a problem in filling you will see pulmonary edema as the major manifestation basically it results in left heart failure progressing towards right heart failure and because the septum is creating obstruction these patients are going to have a systolic dysfunction and because of this if the lv is not pumping the blood out and that is getting blocked then syncopal attack can occur ischemic heart disease features can occur lower blood pressures can occur so all these are possibilities in general that means the patient is going to have clinical features of heart failure if they ask the most common presenting complaint of patients with hocm the answer is dyspnea on exertion okay dyspnea on exertion now majority of patients can present with dyspnea on exertion this is basically a pulmonary edema like picture that is developing you will see some patients presenting because of syncope some patients can come with chest pain and this is angina that is there which is basically on exertion okay chest pain on exertion can be there this angina pain is possible you will also see some patients manifesting because of the micro infarcts these results in pockets of fibrosis around which reentry tracts can occur resulting in cardiac arrhythmias so sometimes the manifestations are because of the cardiac arrhythmias and this cardiac arrhythmias that occur they result in a variety of problems like the patients can come with palpitation some patients can have again syncope because of decrease blood that is being pumped out of the heart because of the arrhythmia sometimes it can result in a ventricular fibrillation that can cause sudden cardiac death and this is obviously the most dangerous presentation sudden cardiac death so there's a variety of manifestations that can be there in patient hocm let me summarize it once again for you either it's a problem of left ventricle filling and pumping means it's a diastolic dysfunction and a systolic dysfunction or this patient is going to have mainly cardiac problems all these patients can have ischemic heart disease features and they'll have chest pain they'll have angina these are all symptoms that can be there now is it possible that the first manifestation the first manifestation is it possible that the first manifestation is sudden cardiac death the answer is yes sometimes we see the index case sudden cardiac death occurs and then once you diagnose the sudden cardiac death then we find that the siblings the children they have the disease and then we start picking up so the index case sometimes might actually have sudden cardiac death and the family members are diagnosed because of that person's death you start investigating because this is an autosomal dominant disease it's a genetic problem so 
how the presentation is is it it varies majority of the patients siblings of the index case that we diagnose obviously are asymptomatic so that in that sense then a large chunk of patients we find are asymptomatic having almost a similar survival to a normal population a minority of them might have sudden cardiac death many of them come to us with heart failure symptoms which is basically dyspnea on exertion or angina on exertion some of them can present with syncope so a uh, array of manifestations can be there but for mcqs the most common presenting complaint if they come with symptoms the answer is dyspnea on exertion in general the concept in the echocardiogram does the systolic dysfunction dominate or the diastolic dysfunction the better answer is diastolic dysfunction because we'll see the ejection fraction in this patient is generally above 50% okay diastolic dysfunction actually is more important so this is as far as how we suspect the patient to be having possibility of a cardiac problem obviously the investigations that we do are we get an ecg done we get an echo done before we discuss about the investigations let's finish off the clinical examination if you look at the examination the pulse in this patients you get something called pulses bisphereens pulses bisphereens this pulses bisphereens is two peaks that are occurring compare this to a normal pulse pattern which is basically a clear peak a dichrotic notch and then you get so this is what we refer to as a dichrotic notch which marks the closure of the aortic valve after the aortic valve the small peak that is occurring is basically because of the elastic recoil of the aorta and this is the tidal wave that is there usually the percussion wave start disappearing after the age of 30 years so what you noticing the first wave that you getting actually the tidal wave and i told you below 30 years you can see percussion wave but generally you see tidal wave and then after the dichrotic notch is the diastolic part what you notice in this patients is this is the dichrotic notch before the dichrotic notch the patient has got two peaks and this is an important aspect that they ask in the exam ki in patients with hocm the pulses bisphereens that occurs results in a double peak does this double peak this peak does it occur before the dichrotic notch or after or does one occur before dichrotic one after dichrotic or both occurring before dichrotic and the idea is this obstruction is occurring in the mid of systole where the septum comes in the way and blocks partially during the peak blockage the dip occurs this dip is occurring and then as the lv forces the blood out further it will push the septum and you will see another peak occurring so the first peak a dip because septal obstruction and then another peak and all this is happening in systole and the concept is ki whatever happens happens before the dichrotic notch meaning it's systolic events so i hope you understand both the peaks are occurring in systole part that's the reason why it's occurring before the dichrotic notch so the examination then you will find ki most patients when we examine the pulse the best place to examine the pulse character is the carotid one exception is bisphereens pulse the more peripheral you go the better you will be able to separate the two peaks out and you will be able to appreciate the pulses bisphereens so the question that they asked in the exam is the carotid a better place to you know palpate the pulse for bisphereens for hocm or is it the brachial the answer was brachial so one is the pulse next you will see this patient having the apical impulse the apical impulse that is there can be a double apical impulse okay a double apical impulse so this double apical impulse again is because the septum comes in the way lv is pumping it jerks and again it pushes the blood and this partial obstruction created by the septum is going to arrest in between and then again it it's it's able to squeeze the blood creating a double impulse which you can feel and that's why we say this is double apical impulse on auscultation in this patients i'm just focusing on the salient features the main features on auscultation you will see this patients having an ejection systolic murmur which is a crescendo decrescendo murmur ejection systolic murmur in the mid of the systole the septum is coming in the way and creating obstruction this results in an esm the ejection systolic murmur and this ejection systolic murmur if you look at the pattern this is s1 you have s2 in between s1 and s2 is the systole and then obviously you have the diastole part that's the next s1 will start after that next cycle will start so basically what you are noticing then is the crescendo decrescendo murmur is a diamond shaped murmur and this diamond shaped murmur 
is occurring somewhere exactly in the middle and that is why we call it as an ejection systolic murmur. Mid of ejection the turbulence is occurring. Why is the turbulence occurring in the middle of ejection? A subiotic stenosis that is there, the septum comes in the way, it creates an obstruction and that obstruction is generating the turbulence and this is an ejection systolic murmur. Now you might say ki this kind of looks very similar to a valvular aortic stenosis. What points are there that will tell ki whether it is a valvular aortic stenosis or whether the patient has a subiotic stenosis. So let us look at the comparison. If it had been a aortic stenosis or if it is a patient having a HOCM which is nothing but a subvalvular aortic stenosis, subvalvular aortic stenosis. So, how do we clinically differentiate auscultation wise? If you are able to get an ejection systolic murmur best heard in the aortic area with conduction towards the carotids, this is very classical for aortic stenosis. However, if you get an ejection systolic murmur that is better heard in the herbs area, this is the third intercostal space in the left of the sternum. Ideally, you expect the murmur generated from the iota to be conducted towards the second intercostal space on the right of the sternum. So, right of the sternum is the aortic area. But we are getting the murmur better left parasternal area, which is also referred to as the herbs area, and the murmurs are loudest over there. The ejection systolic murmur is loudest. The second important feature is generally this murmur does not does not conduct towards the carotid. Does not conduct towards the carotids. So conduction towards carotid becomes a very important feature to differentiate and tell whether it is a aortic stenosis or a subiotic stenosis. The other Associated features are the presence of an ejection click tells you this is a damaged valve which is opening with a sound that is an ejection click. You cannot get an ejection click because the valve is normal in HOCM problem not in valve the problem is below the valve. So valve disease one of the clues is the valve will open with a sound and the opening of the valve with a sound is known as an ejection click. You will not get that in patients with a subvalvular pathology. Rest of it is basically the supportive treatment you get in the other examination. For example, if you get a pulses parvus et tardis, this is a slow rising pulse, low volume, slow rising pulse known as pulses parvus et tardis. Then we are talking about aortic stenosis. If you get a brisk pulse with a double peak, this is pulses bisphyrians, then we are talking about HOCM. So, these are the ways how you can differentiate and tell whether it is aortic stenosis or whether it is a subiotic problem like HOCM. What else can happen in HOCM is many patients with HOCM also tend to have a systolic murmur in the mitral area mainly because of mitral regurgitation. So, mitral regurgitation is common in patients with HOCM. Why that mitral regurgitation occurs, I will tell you. This is a kind of a functional MR that is generated. And this can result in pansystolic murmur which is heard in the mitral area. You may not get that or you will not get that in patients with unless there is a separate disease in the mitral valve, you will not get that in aortic stenosis. Why mitral regurgitation is such an important feature of HOCM, we will discuss as we go along. So to summarize then, the examination is going to show a murmur which is an ejection systolic murmur. Typically aortic stenosis, the murmurs are loudest in the aortic area which is right of the sternum, second intercostal space. But these murmurs are better heard in the left parasternal area, lower left parasternal area in the third or fourth intercostal space. If you look at the conduction to carotid is very classical for aortic stenosis. This conduction to carotid does not occur in patients with HOCM. Third problem or the third important clue is the ejection click on auscultation tells you it is a valve pathology. Here the valve is normal. The problem is below the valve, septum is obstructing. So we will not get an ejection click. The presence of the bisphyrian's pulse is a, obviously a very important clue. If you get a slow rising low volume pulse, it is aortic stenosis. A brisk double beating, double peaking pulse is classical for HOCM. So all these are the clues that will help us differentiate and tell whether we are talking about an aortic valve disease or it is a subvalvular pathology like HOCM. One major differentiating feature actually is 
dynamic auscultation the murmur varies significantly with hocm the variation with dynamic auscultation is not much matlab if you make the patient stand if you make the patient squat if you do valsalva there will be variation in the character or the loudness of the murmur this variation is very minimal in aortic stenosis it's very dramatic in patients with hocm so where will dynamic auscultation make a very important role in diagnosing the problem okay dynamic auscultation is very helpful may not have that much benefit in establishing the diagnosis of aortic stenosis so dynamic auscultation is another important tool that we focus on making the patient stand and auscultate patient in supine position we auscultate squatting we auscultate valsalva we auscultate hand grip we auscultate and it will cause a lot of variation in the murmur so that you can easily pick it up that this variation is going towards the diagnosis of hocm the variation that you get in aortic stenosis is not that significant not that much so this is as far as the various features that are there that will tell us okay, whether this murmur is going towards a valvular pathology like as aortic stenosis or it's a subvalvular disease like a patient having hocm the point is keep both aortic stenosis and hocm might have overlapping clinical feature because angina dyspnea and syncope are hallmark features of aortic stenosis similar features we already saw can occur in patients with hocm as well majority of questions that you notice are about the murmur and how the murmur varies with dynamic auscultation so how does the murmur vary with dynamic auscultation in general our concept in cardiology is more the blood passing through a damaged valve the more the turbulence it will create the louder murmur you will get hocm in that aspect is peculiar the lesser the blood passing through the damaged valve the louder the murmur it creates okay less blood passing through the damaged zone the louder the murmur is surprising because everywhere in cardiology we see the more blood you push through the damaged valve the more turbulence it will create this basic simple physics okay you got a damaged valve the more blood you push through it the more turbulence you generate louder the murmur this is ulta here less blood creates louder murmur second important concept and this is not unique it happens everywhere higher the force of contraction higher the force of contraction the louder the murmur but this is not unique because obviously the more the force of contraction the more the pressure gradient that is generated the more the gradient the more velocity the blood will move creating higher turbulence louder murmur that is nothing special for hocm that happens in almost all the conditions more the gradient louder the murmur that's nothing special but what's unique is the low blood creating loud murmur that is special for hocm let's see why that is occurring when you look at a murmur in hocm in a person who is standing compared to supine what do you expect the murmur to be typically supine auscultation there's more blood passing through the heart in supine and that's why you get more turbulences and that's why supine position is ideal to auscultate in most patients however in hocm when you make the patient stand from supine you you notice the murmur actually becomes louder and the reason for that is partly the venous return to to some extent to the heart becomes lesser there's more pooling of blood to in the lower limbs and the blood passing through the heart to some extent will decrease and i already told you lesser the blood louder the turbulence more the murmur now why would that occur see the concept over here so you have a septum that is basically creating the obstruction this is a septum this left ventricle this is the aorta now what's happening here is that if the septum is coming in the way obviously it will going to create the obstruction now this obstruction that is there is not a fixed obstruction as you would see in an aortic valve pathology in aortic valve a fixed obstruction is there aortic valve is became narrowed it became calcified that's aortic stenosis and you have so much orifice that much orifice is there every time this is not the case here because the amount of obstruction the septum is doing depends on the amount of blood collected at the end of diastole let's say the amount of blood collected is less then the septum being a very flabby structure will come partly 
in the way and will create turbulence and will create obstruction. However, if the amount of blood collected is more, then you notice the septum starts getting shifted away and the more the septum is shifted away, the inner diameter will increase. The more the inner diameter will increase, it becomes easier for the LV to pump the blood out in the iota. And that means the obstruction itself is going away because the septum is pushed out of the you know zone of ejection and if the septum is pushed away from ejection, then there is no turbulence, the blood is ejected out easily into the iota. Which means then, that the murmur to some extent depends on how much the ventricle filled in diastole. If it fills more, the septum is pushed away. If it fills less, the septum is creating obstruction. This explains why less blood creates more murmur, because less blood will allow septum to come below the iota and cause more obstruction. If you look at a patient with Valsalva, you know Valsalva is another thing that decreases the venous return, the blood return to the left heart. And for this reason, if Valsalva by increasing pressure in the thorax, if the heart is compressed from all direction and it fills less, then obviously the LV blood is less. If the LV is filling less, septum comes in the way, creating more obstruction. In a patient who is squatting, In general, we know that squatting increases the venous return. This is because like a toothpaste, the calf is getting squeezed more. As the calf is squeezed more, the LV fills more. The more the LV fills, the septum pushed away. So in squatting, the murmur is going to decrease. Very similar to what you get in squatting, you will see in patients with hand grip. In hand grip, actually, the pressure in the iota will increase. If you do hand grip, if you do hand grip, then obviously more resistance in the peripheral circuit higher pressure in the iota. If there is higher pressure in the iota, then remember that the flow of blood, the higher the velocity, the greater the turbulence it can generate. Imagine if the pressure is high, can the blood move from LV to iota more forcefully, faster or slower? Naturally, the flow of blood will slow down. And if the blood flow slows down, then obviously you are going to get lesser turbulence, lesser murmur. So the entire flow of blood to the iota starts slowing down. Gradient is not there. And remember the higher the gradient, one side very low pressure, one side high pressure, the blood will move turbulence, more velocity, the more the velocity, more the turbulence. That is gone in hand grip. This is the reason why hand grip, the murmur decreases. If you were to put the patient on nitrates, nitrates are venodilators. They pull the blood in the periphery, in the lower limb and the venous return to the heart is decreased. LV fills less. If the LV is filling less because the blood is basically pulled outside, then this is going to put the septum in the path, creates more obstruction. So obviously the murmur will increase. So let me repeat, nitrates are venodilators. They'll pull the blood in the periphery. The venous return to the heart decreases, creating more obstruction. If you were to put the patient on beta blockers, beta blockers reduce the rate and allow the heart to spend more time in diastole. If they spend more time in diastole, naturally they are getting an opportunity to fill more. If they are able to fill more, then obviously the septum is pushed out of the zone, allowing smoother exit of blood, obstruction will come down. So beta blockers will decrease the turbulence, decrease the murmur. You will understand later as I explain why beta blockers are the drugs of choice in HOCM. One is they definitely improve the hemodynamics, they reduce the obstruction. But the big problem in HOCM is the sudden cardiac death triggered by arrhythmias. And we now know that in most of the arrhythmias, catecholamines seem to be playing an important role. By blocking that catecholamine effect, we can protect the patient against development of major arrhythmias. So these are all important findings that happen in patients with HOCM. Let's look at the investigations then. In the investigations, obviously the echocardiogram is the main thing that will make the diagnosis of HOCM for us. It will show the asymmetric left ventricular hypertrophy with a very large septum and that is the main anchor point to make the diagnosis. Sometimes, especially if it's an apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the echo may not be that good to pick it up, in which case we need to rely on the MR. The MRI clarity is far superior to the echo and the MR in any kind of doubt, MR is going to make sure, I mean make it very obvious that this is going towards hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the septal hypertrophy, increased septal thickness, LV OT obstruction, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, the turbulence that occurs because of the septum coming in the way. But the most important point, and this is what they ask in our exam, 
is a very classical finding called SAM. This is the main thing that they ask and you should be aware of this. What is this SAM in echocardiogram? The SAM is systolic anterior motion of mitral valve. Why is this systolic anterior motion of mitral valve occurring? It occurs because, say this is the iota, we have the left ventricle, we have the left atrium, left atrium, iota, left ventricle, this is the anterior, this is the posterior, you have the anterior mitral leaflet, you have the posterior mitral leaflet and there is an obstruction that is occurring and this obstruction that is occurring is partly because of the septum creating the blockage and what this will do is when the LV blood is getting passed out into the iota because of the LV obstruction, this is going to generate a high velocity, a very high velocity is generated and that high velocity creates a low pressure. Normally what we expect is in left ventricle systole, the aortic valve should be open and the mitral valve should be shut, the mitral valve should be shut. That is what we normally expect in left ventricle when it is in systole. But now what is happening? When it is in systole, this septum comes in the way, creates a lot of obstruction, generates high velocity and the high velocity creates a low pressure circuit and the low pressure is going to suck the anterior leaflet of mitral valve open. There are other concepts of explaining why the mitral leaflet is sucked open when the LV is pumping. One such mechanism is the shape of the LV that is the septum that is there. This when the left ventricle blood is going, it is going to generate a you know circular movement of blood that creates a, a drag. This drag is going to pull the mitral leaflet open. So, there are various explanations suggesting why the mitral valve opens when the LV is in systole. I think the very simplest way is because the septum comes in the way, it generates a high velocity and high velocity by the Venturi effect or the Bernoulli principle creates a low pressure. The low pressure sucks the mitral leaflet open. So, regardless of the reason then what we are noticing is the mitral valve opens and partly this mitral leaflet comes towards, towards the iota, iota, the septal side and now one side is the septum, one side is the mitral leaflet and together they are going to cause more obstruction. So, mitral valve and the septum they are coming narrowing the outflow, the more the narrow they make it, the more turbulence is going to generate it and not only the turbulence, the obstruction is going to significantly increase. This repeated banging of the mitral valve towards the septal side might create erosion and plaque formation on the mitral valve and that also can result in mitral valve pathology and later we will see when we are trying to do surgery, just septal myectomy may not solve the issue. Many times you need to do mitral valve repair as well for the mitral regurgitation that is generated. So, do patients with HOCM have mitral regurgitation? The answer is yes. Why did it occur? It is because of the mitral leaflet getting sucked open. The repeated opening and banging against the opposite side is going to erode part of the mitral valve, damage it and that can result in a plaque. So, we are ending up with a damaged mitral valve over a period of time and this might result in mitral regurgitation. So, basically we have eject, obstruct, leak. This is a triad we talk about eject, the LV is ejecting, obstruct, the mitral valve is getting you know pulled out and creating obstruction and leak that is regurgitation that is occurring in the atria. So, patients with HOCM then I told you come with two important murmurs. One is the ejection systolic murmur because of the blockage of the septum and the other is the mitral regurgitation murmur which is a pan systolic murmur you get in this condition. So, this is the echo finding known as SAM systolic anterior motion of mitral valve. In my clinical examination I forgot to mention one thing and that is that these patients on, on auscultation apart from the murmur they also have one more thing and that is usually the S4. The S4 that occurs in this patient is mainly because of the diastolic dysfunction, the thick ventricle becomes stiff, the stiff ventricle can't expand and receive the blood from atria. So, on auscultation you can get an S4. As you know in general the diastolic dysfunctions, the restrictive cardiomyopathy scenarios or the restriction in the myocardial expansion, all this results in S4. In conditions where you get more preload, you end up with S3. This is not a condition with more preload, this is a condition that is associated with a stiffer ventricle making S4 more likely to occur. So, on examination then, what are the things that you noticed? We talked about the pulse, we talked about the murmurs, we also should know that an S4 can occur on auscultation. So, this is as far as the echocardiogram is concerned. 
you will understand what I am saying about the echocardiogram. If you look at this of this image, you notice that the septum is so thickened, this definitely very thick septum and this is the left atrium, this is the left atrium, this is the left ventricle and left ventricle is pumping the blood out. This is the aortic zone over here which is not well seen but you can make out the large left atrium, you can make out the left ventricle is becoming small, definitely you can appreciate the very thick septum that is there. But look at this particular image. Now what you are noticing is this is the left ventricle. You can make out that this is the outflow into the iota, this is the iota and this is the left atrium, right? This is the left atrium. This left atrium, this you can make out is the left atrium, this is the iota and this is the left ventricle. You notice when the left ventricle is going into systole, this mitral valve that is there over here is getting sucked out of the way and it is basically going towards the septum that is there, this is septum. This enlarged septum that is there and the mitral fled, they are coming in the way and creating a problem, making the obstruction to occur. So, I hope you understood the concept here. So, basically, in the still image, you can appreciate better. You can make out what I am showing this is a thickened septum. Okay, you can make out this is the left ventricle, this is the iota, this is the left atrium, these are the mitral leaflets, this mitral leaflet and the septum, this is the septum that is thickened and this mitral leaflet is getting pulled towards the septum, creating an obstruction for the LV to push the blood out in the iota. So, this is the issue that we are getting, that is the reason why we are seeing the obstruction increasing by the opening of the mitral valve, this is what I call SAM, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. So, if you carefully notice here, you can appreciate that every time the LV is going into systole, it is dragging the mitral valve open and is dragging the mitral valve open resulting in some regurgitation in the atria and some more obstruction created by the blood entering into the iota. So, this is how the MR and the echocardiogram can help in making the diagnosis for us for HOCM. What remains then is we did the echo, looked at the, the the echocardiogram and I was telling you the echo is a very important tool in establishing the diagnosis. This is the left ventricle, you notice the left atrium has become larger in size, there is a four chamber view in the echo, the septum is definitely very very thick, a thickened left septum, this LV, this is the left atrium and you do notice the mitral valve mentioned here, this mitral valve is difficult to appreciate in a still image but then the mitral valve is dynamically creating an obstruction and it is coming close to the septum and together mitral valve and the septum are creating the obstruction. So, this is how we make the diagnosis as far as the echo and MR is concerned. If you look at the ECG, what the ECG is going to show is the septum is thicker and the thicker septum is basically going to show the Q waves. So, you are all aware about how the recording happens, there is a thick septum, the septal activity actually in the inferior leads and lateral leads is recorded as the Q wave. Normally, the Q wave is less than one small box in height and width, but here you will start noticing the leads looking from below because the movement of the current that is there is from, you know, the his bundle comes, right and left bundle divides here, the current is released from the lower part of the septum and it starts ascending up the septum. As it starts ascending in septum, all the leads looking from below, what are the leads looking from below? The 2, the 3, the AVF and the inferior leads are looking at the current going towards or going away, going away because the thicker septum, the vectors going into the septum from below upward are large. This is going to generate a downward deflection which is recorded as the Q wave. So, you notice the Q wave are significant in the inferior leads, the 2, 3 AVF are showing good amount of Q wave. Also, you notice V6 for example, do not forget that the septum, the current in the septum mainly comes from left bundle, goes towards right bundle. The thicker the septum, the larger the current is going from left to right, making the left ventricle, I mean the LV leads, the V5, the V6, the lead 1, the AVL, all the cameras, all the leads looking from the left side, they will start showing a Q wave that is more important, more significant. So, you can make out, especially the lateral leads, the V5, the V6, good amount of Q wave good amount of Q wave visible. In V6, you can clearly make out how deep the Q wave is and in V5 also the Q wave is so deep and you can make out the inferior leads and the lateral leads, all of them are showing good amount of Q wave and the septal activity is picked up as the Q wave normally also in these leads. 
so the occurrence of the q wave is basically going to help us establish the possibility or suspect the possibility of hocm many patients as i told you might develop ischemic heart disease features and this is because hocm is known to be an important cause of ischemic heart disease precipitation mi is very common in these patients also i told you that in patients with hocm arrhythmia is also very common and the reason for the arrhythmia is the fibrosis the myocardial disarray the pockets of fibrosis around the reentry tracts are known to occur and that is one of the reasons how you can explain the cardiac arrhythmias in some patients when only apex is involved apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy we say it's not involving the entire septum the disease is more near the apex those patients you will see that they'll have t wave inversion and large voltage complexes large voltage complexes with t wave large voltages look how tall the qrs complexes are in v3 in v4 look how tall they are so tall qrs complexes with symmetric t wave inversions are very classical in patients with septal apical part of you know uh, uh, involvement and apical H hcm we say apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a variation of the standard or the typical hocm that you get and these patients you will notice this kind of changes you will see the t wave inversions and you will see the large voltage qrs complexes this peculiar feature suggests towards possibility this is apical H hocm and this apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should be investigated by echocardiogram or mri so this is how we establish the diagnosis based on the ecg the echo and the mri as far as the treatment is concerned the main treatment the drug of choice if they ask you the answer is beta blocker okay medical management surgical management two options are there in the medical management the major issue is beta blockers we can also use drugs that suppress the heart because the slower the heart rate the more time the lv will fill the more the lv will fill then the septum is pushed out of zone of obstruction allowing better exit of blood from the lv so we can use a drug like beta blocker if there is a contraindication for beta blocker then we use the l type calcium channel blockers with is diltiazem and verapamil these can be used we can also use the negative inotrope disopiramide disopiramide so disopiramide is also another option and all these are negative inotrope all of them slow the rate in the heart allowing the lv to fill more allowing better ejection they ask in the exam again which is the drug of choice the answer is beta blocker if it's contraindicated there is an airway disease then we go for other options apart from these it's important to realize that if you try to do anything in which the aortic pressure decreases the lower the aortic pressure then the lv blood that is getting ejected out the pressure gradient will be more and this is going to basically worsen the patient so do not use calcium channel blockers like amlodipine nifedipine they are going to worsen the patient anything that is vasodilatory in nature is not good we don't want a pressure gradient develop where the aortic pressure is low and the lv pressure is high it creates more obstruction more turbulence the faster the blood flows higher velocity the lower the pressure the lower the pressure septum is pulled mitral valve from the other side it will create more obstruction so that's why we don't want to decrease the pressure in the aorta so don't use the you know non diadroperidine so basically don't use the calcium channel blockers like amlodipine nifedipine and all that stuff also do not use diuretics unless the patient has got pulmonary edema in which case we should be very cautious of using diuretic don't forget anything that decreases the filling of the left ventricle the septum comes more in the way creates more obstruction so make sure we avoid drugs that decrease the volume of blood in the left ventricle don't use diuretics don't use anything that is going to dehydrate the patient it is going to worsen the patient in a patient whom we are worried of sudden cardiac death there is a role of putting intracardiac defibrillator the intracardiac defibrillator is definitely a protective zone ki any dangerous arrhythmia if it occurs it will immediately shock the patient out of the arrhythmia so this is a defense system this is like a uh you know um a precaution to make sure that dangerous arrhythmias don't kill the patient so intracardiac cardioverter defibrillator is definitely an important role has an important role in protecting against dangerous arrhythmias surgical myectomy is another very important option which is going to decrease the pressure gradient and as you cut the septum and remove out the extra septum that is coming in the way 
then definitely the LV outflow into the aorta becomes much better. The pressure gradients that are there will start decreasing and the load on the left ventricle becomes lesser. Obviously, the load on the left atrium and uh, you know pulmonary edema, all this decongestion will start occurring and this is definitely one of the treatment options. Alcohol injection of the septum is another mechanism, another method which is shown to contract the septum to some extent and reduce the obstruction. So, these are other options that are there that also are considered and there are clear indications for this which are not really required for our level of MCQs. So just know but these are options like surgical myectomy, alcohol injection in septum are other options in the treatment in patients with HOCM. One of the biggest danger of patients with HOCM is that these patients can have sudden death. Now, who will have sudden cardiac death and who will have you know almost a normal lifespan is very difficult to tell. So, where we have to be very cautious in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is anybody having syncope, that's a red flag, they are at very high risk of developing sudden cardiac death. Patients with family history of sudden death, one of the family members already has died, then this is high risk. And extreme hypertrophy, more than 3 centimeter thickness if you are getting of the septum, definitely the risk is very, very high. So, these as per the American Cardiac, uh, you know, Heart Association and American Cardiac College, College of uh, Cardiology, American Co College of Cardiology and AHA, they find these three to be the most important predictors. If they are there, then ICD becomes important, septal myectomy becomes important. So, you need to be more aggressive in the management of these patients because they can die suddenly. European Society of Cardiology actually came up with an app and now is all the zone of app. They have a scoring system, a calculator is available that will calculate for us the risk probability of these patients having sudden cardiac death. And obviously, those kind of calculations and all are not really required for our level of patients as I told you. But just needs to understand what patients we should be very cautious who can progress to develop sudden cardiac death. The other soft markers they are suggesting are that development of BT in a patient, left atrial dilatation, obviously LV is not expanding and receiving blood, puts the load on the left atrium and left atrium will dilate. This is another clue you might get in the ECG which will show left atrial dilatation and it, that will be a P mitral picture. Hypotensive response to exercise, so when you do the treadmill test, the BP should increase. On exercise, the BP is not rising but dropping, that is bad, that is hypotensive response to exercise. MRI is also known to show, late gadolinium enhancement actually shows scar, scar is becoming bright in MR on gadolinium enhancement. So, scar formations if you are getting micro infarcts, they are at risk because around them re-entry tracts will occur resulting in dangerous arrhythmias. So, all these are also clues. So, whenever you are working up a patient with HOCM, which is now called as HCM, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, history is definitely important, echo is important, ECG is important, but also we can do the treadmill test and also evaluate those patients. So, I told you already the major management, the medical management is beta blocker, we discussed calcium channel blockers, disopyramide and I told you about two mechanical management that is surgical. One is surgical myectomy and the other is alcohol ablation. So, generally where medical management is not working or the patient is at risk of sudden cardiac death, then we go for more aggressive surgical treatment and intracardiac defibrillator. So, surgical myectomy, the indications are actually not MCQs, but just for your completion sake, I am doing. These are medically refractory symptoms where the outflow obstruction gradient is more than 30 or 50. If they are good surgical candidates and they are having another valve that anyway has to be repaired by surgery, then in such patients, better you might also go for septal myectomy. So, do not bother about the procedure details. However, you can see in the echo that this is where the obstruction is occurring. You can make out this is the left ventricle. The left ventricle should eject the blood out in the iota. There is a left atrium, you can make out the left atrium size is much more bigger than normal. So, this is the left ventricle. Left ventricle should eject the blood out in the iota and the mitral valve and the septum is blocking it up, right? And you can see the left atrium is so dilated. So, if this kind of obstruction is occurring, no doubt the pressure gradient that is there is 108 millimeter mercury. So, very large gradient is developed between the LV and the iota because of the obstruction. But imagine after the surgery, the septum has been cut. If the septum has been cut, the LV now can smoothly throw the blood out in the iota. And if the LV is throwing the blood out in the iota, notice the pressure gradient now has become 11. So, this is one of the benefits of the surgery. You can see this is the obstruction that is there. 
the obstruction that is created partly by the septum which is thickened you can make out the very large septum that is there and the mitral leaflet that is getting pulled open creating the obstruction you can make out the left atrium is dilated and the left ventricle over here but see after the myectomy septal myectomy you can see the flow of blood i'm showing in the red arrow which is almost becoming so good and the blockade zone you have opened up this is the aortic orifice is opened up and because the aortic orifice is opened up the mitral leaflet is not getting pulled open so this is as far as the surgery is concerned so alcohol injection in the septum is another method i told you that will contract up the septum reducing the septal thickness to some extent so all these are ways how we can manage patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so this is more or less the important zone or important uh, area where we are seeing frequent you know questions and important concept connected with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so um, i thank my friend uh, dr praveen for presenting the initial pathophysio features and then we discussed about uh, various clinical aspects and the investigations and management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy thank you